No, I, I think we're ready hit, if you're all set. We've just hit 50, uh, which is a very respectable audience, I think. Right, so uh, uh, welcome back to day three of Lean Together. Uh, uh, the, I'm introducing the next three talks, and the first of which is by Paula Neely, who's a student of Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Avogad in Pittsburgh, and she's going to tell us about some results in modal and dynamic epistemic logic. Over to you, Paula. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, as Kevin said, I'm going to be sharing some results I've formalized in modal and dynamic epistemic logic. This work is in partial fulfillment of my master's thesis here at CMU, uh, supervised by Jeremy. Um, I may continue along this track for my PhD dissertation, or I may decide to switch topics in terms of formalization, but um, this is what I've formalized so far. And then you can see the formalization for yourself at the GitHub repo listed here, or I posted it um, along with my slides at the Zulip chat. So I'll assume that at least some of you are a little bit familiar with modal logic, but probably fewer or maybe even none of you are familiar with dynamic epistemic logic. So what is this? Basically, dynamic epistemic logic is a logical framework for reasoning about agent knowledge and how that knowledge changes as agents communicate with each other. So with talk of agents, as you might imagine, it's useful in a wide variety of applications. You can reason about agents in economics, game theory, artificial intelligence, or cryptography, just to name a few fields. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on a fragment of dynamic epistemic logic called public announcement logic without common knowledge. And then the theory I formalized comes from several chapters out of this book. So the roadmap for today is I'll present the theory that I formalized of public announcement logic, including an example, um, because I think it'll help you get a better feel for the logic and for the kind of problems it's useful in solving. And then I'll just conclude and give some ideas for future work. Okay, the muddy children puzzle. Here's a story. Uh, three children go to the park to play. When their father comes to find them, he sees that two of them have mud on their foreheads. The father announces, at least one of you has mud on your forehead, and then asks them, do you know if you have mud on your forehead? The children simultaneously respond, I don't know. The father then repeats his question, do you know if you have mud on your forehead? This time, the two children with muddy foreheads simultaneously answer, yes, I do, while the remaining child again answers, I don't know. Okay, so don't worry if it isn't immediately apparent to you why the muddy children know that they're muddy. I'm gonna guide us through this together. But this is actually a theorem. So if there are n children, k less than n of whom are muddy, then the k children can know that they're muddy after the father repeats his question k times. Uh, the proof is by induction on k, but rather than doing the proof, um, I'm gonna walk us through the example where two out of three children are muddy because I think it's gonna help convey the intuition and it'll actually be helpful for understanding the formalization itself. Um, I just wanna take a minute though to point out, I think this theorem is a little bit weird personally. It seems like nothing is happening. Like the father just keeps asking, do you know if you're muddy? Do you know if you're muddy over and over again? And the children just keep answering, I don't know, I don't know. And strictly by virtue of this happening enough times, the knowledge state of some children can change and all of a sudden they know that they're muddy. That strikes me as incredibly odd. So let's see what's going on here. Um, so here's the setup. I'll explain this directed graph in more detail, but basically it models the initial states of uncertainty. So we have eight nodes and I'll use the word node or world or state interchangeably in the discussion that follows. But these nodes represent uh, the different possible worlds. So we have three children, each of whom are either muddy or not. So these nodes enumerate those possibilities. And then the numbered edges between the nodes represent each child's uncertainty between states. So obviously no child can see his or own, her own forehead. So for example, world MMM is indistinguishable for child one between worlds CMM because all child one sees are two other muddy foreheads. So that's how to read this graph. Let's examine what happens after the father announces at least one of you has mud on your forehead. Okay, well, if one of them is muddy, then they can't all be clean. So this world kind of disappears, right? And the children know that this world is no longer a possibility. So as a result, the uncertainty involving that world must also disappear for the children. 
So if MCC is the true state of the world that, obt that obtains, then child one would at this point become certain that MCC is the correct state, right? Because child one sees two other clean foreheads. The father said, at least one of you has mud on your forehead. So child one knows it, it must be me. By symmetry, the same argument holds for a child two at world CMC and child three at world CCM. Okay, this step's slightly trickier. Um, what happens after the, after the children simultaneously announce, I don't know. It's not obvious, but I claim that there's enough information for the children to know that MCC, CMC, and CCM are no longer possibilities, or basically just the worlds where only one child is muddy. Um, consider MCC, for example, again. If it were the case that only one child was muddy, that child wouldn't have said, I don't know. They would have been seeing two other clean foreheads, so they would have known that they were the muddy one. But because this didn't happen, we can't be at one of these states. So these states disappear. And as a result, the uncertainty involving these states must also disappear for the children. So we see at MMC, child one and two become certain. At MCM, child one and three. And at CMM, child two and three. So this is also a good time to point out, like I said, I thought that this theorem was weird because it seemed like nothing was happening. But here we can see exactly what's happening. Like after these announcements, the children are able to rule out possibilities. And if they can do this enough, then they can actually come to know which world they're in and they can come to a state of knowledge about that. Okay, finally, um, what happens after the father repeats his question, do you know if you have mud on your forehead? This time we see the result that we saw in the story where the two children with muddy foreheads simultaneously answer, yes, I do. And the remaining child answers, I don't know. So whichever one of these three worlds obtains where two of the children are muddy, as you can see, it's only the clean child that remains uncertain about that state and the other two children have a certainty. Okay, so that was a little toy example, but hopefully it provided some motivation for this logic and we can start to dive into the theory. So the way I'm gonna do this is actually by introducing two languages and two definitions of validity and two proof systems kind of in parallel, one being more basic than the other. And the reason for this will become apparent shortly, but let's start with the language of epistemic logic. So given a finite set of agents and a countable set of primitive propositions, the language of epistemic logic is defined inductively as follows. Formulas can either be the constant false they can be propositional variables, they can be an implication between two existing formulas, or they can involve the necessity operator applied to an existing formula. So for those of you who are familiar with modal logic, you're probably used to seeing this necessity operator as a box. Um, but here we're writing it ka phi, and it's read as agent A knows that phi. It's important to point out though, that this is just the basic modal language indexed over agents. It's really nothing special going on here. The language of public announcement logic builds on this. So as you can see on the right, we have a new operator bracket phi psi. And this update operator is read as after every truthful announcement of phi psi holds. So if you think back to the puzzle, public announcements were made uh, maybe of the form phi, and we wanted to reason about which propositions were true after each announcement. So this is just how we represent that in the formal language. Next, we can start to define the semantics. So a Kripke frame is a tuple where we have a non-empty set of possible worlds and a function R superscript A, which yields for each agent a binary relation called the accessibility relation between worlds. So you've already seen what this looks like from the example at the beginning, but this enables us to talk about things like world Y is accessible from world W for agent A. Building on this, we have the definition of Kripke models. So this is just a frame together with evaluation function. And this enables us to say things like proposition P sub N is true at world W, or we have this semantic bracket notation, which denotes the set of all worlds in M where some proposition is true. So there's a lot of notation here and not all of you are familiar with it, but the big picture is basically there are worlds, different propositions are true or false at each world. And there's an accessibility relation that describes which worlds each individual agent considers possible. 
So these two definitions of Kripke frames and Kripke models are used interchangeably with both languages. We can extend truth for primitive propositions to all formulas. So hopefully the first three clauses for the basic connectives are familiar to you. So false is never true at any world. Um, P sub n is true at world W if W is in the valuation of P. Um, phi implies psi is true at W if and only if, if W um, models phi, then W models psi. And then the last clause is probably the least familiar, um, but the way to read this is agent A knows phi at W if phi is true at every world that's accessible from W for agent A. Um, public announcement logic needs an extra clause for the update operator bracket phi psi. And the effect of the public announcement of phi is that it restricts the model to all and only those states where phi holds. So at the bottom here, you can see um, the new model is a, a restriction of the old model where the new worlds are only the worlds where phi holds. The new relation is the old relation intersected with the Cartesian project, uh, product of the set of worlds where phi holds. And the new valuation is the old valuation intersected with the set of worlds where phi holds. So this is what we saw with the example at the beginning. The father announcing at least one of you has a muddy forehead essentially removed the state CCC where all the children were clean. And it restricted the model to only those states where at least one child had a muddy forehead. As a result, the relation and the valuation became restricted as well. Switching over to syntax, we can give the proof system S5 for epistemic logic. So here we have all instances of propositional tautologies and all instances of the following axiom schemas. Hopefully these axiom schemas should accord with our intuitions. So consider distribution of K over arrow. So the way to read this is um, if you know that phi implies psi, then if you know phi, then you should be able to know psi. Um, we have truth. If you know phi, then phi is true. Um, hopefully we only know true things. Belief is another matter. We might believe things that aren't true, but hopefully knowledge is stronger than that. We have positive introspection, where if you know phi, then you know that you know phi. And we have negative introspection, where if you don't know phi, then you know that you don't know phi. And then we have the two standard rules of inference, modus ponens, and necessitation. The proof system PA for public announcement logic uh, is basically the same. We have some additional rules for the update operator that are highlighted in green. It's a lot to look at, but basically they just govern how the update operator interacts with other connectives. So for example, the last one, um, announcement composition is important because it reduces a composition of two announcements into kind of a conjunction of announcements. So this is helpful when driving theorems involving multiple announcements. Okay, the two proof systems S5 and PA are defined inductively in lean. So the notion of provability is also defined inductively as follows. Uh, given a proof system, either S5 or PA, a formula phi is provable from it if either phi is an axiom, phi follows from provable formula psi and chi by modus ponens, or phi follows from provable formula psi by necessitation. Okay, with these definitions in hand, we can start to think about soundness and completeness. So as a reminder, soundness means that if you can prove it in the proof system, then it's valid or true. And completeness means that all true statements are provable in the proof system. So S5, uh, if we have that the proof system S5 is sound and complete with respect to the class of frames whose relation is an equivalence relation, or in this case, uh, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So the proof of soundness is by induction on the provability relation. Um, for the other direction, completeness, uh, the proof is by contraposition using a canonical model construction. So this is pretty standard. For PA, it turns out that the proof system PA is sound and complete with respect to the exact same class. So this is a little strange because PA had all those extra axiom schemas about announcement, right? Um, but public announcement logic, or at least the, the kind I said before, this version without common knowledge, is actually of special interest to modal logicians for theoretical reasons related to its expressive power. 
So theoretically, the language of public announcement logic has the same expressive power as the language of epistemic logic. And by, by expressive power, I mean that um, there's no formula that can be written in the language of public announcement logic that can't also be written in the language of epistemic logic. Now, from a practical standpoint, having announcement operators is very useful. Um, without them, formulas could become quite lengthy. And kind of by analogy, there's a reason we don't all use Sheffer strokes all the time. It's nice to have other connectives um, to make formulas a little shorter or easier to read. But theoretically, um, these two languages are, are essentially the same. So in order to prove completeness for PA, it suffices to define a translation function from the language of public announcement logic to the language of epistemic logic and show that every formula is provably equivalent to its translation. So this is what the translation function looks like. Um, as you can see, the first four clauses, they're really not doing anything special. Um, the last four clauses, the, the last five clauses, sorry. Um, basically what these are doing is they're either pushing the public announcement inside of other formulas or they're letting us rewrite announcements in terms of simpler formulas. So picking on the last axiom here again at the bottom, um, as you can see, the formula on the right isn't a sub formula of the formula on the left. So it's not immediately clear that it's actually simpler. Um, so to show that it's simpler, we'll need to define a complexity measure, and that's kind of part of the work in this formalization. So as I said before, we want to show that every formula is provably equivalent to its translation. We can't do induction on formulas, so we'll do induction on the complexity of formulas. And as a corollary, PA completeness follows from S5 completeness. So that's the big picture view of the public announcement logic that I formalized in Lean. I'd like to mention that this represented only a portion of my overall project. I also formalized some more general model theoretic results in definability and undefinability. I'm gonna to touch on these ideas very briefly, but there's not gonna be time to go into them in much detail. So please either see the GitHub repo or talk to me afterward if you're interested in learning more about it. So, in modal logic, um, we often think of classes of frames and their associated accessibility relations as capturing properties of directed graphs. So one question that's of interest to modal logicians concerns the connection between an accessibility relation and the truth of specific formulas in frames admitting that relation. So we could say that phi defines a class of frames if for all frames f, f is in that class if and only if f models phi. So examples of this are um, box P implies P defines a class of reflexive frames. And I'm using the box here instead of K because these results are more general. Um, or we have that LURBS formula defines the class of frames that are transitive and admit no infinite R paths. So these are just examples, but you can actually prove some pretty neat results with this. Um, so one question is, is, is every graph property definable by a modal formula? Um, well, the answer is no. Uh, one way to see this is there are, there are countably many formulas in the modal language, but there are, are an uncountable number of relational properties for graphs. So we can say that a class of frames is undefinable if there does not exist a modal formula that defines it. The way to prove undefinability is um, we rely on invariance under disjoint unions, generated subframes, by simulations, or surjective bounded morphisms. These results are included in my lean formalization, and that's kind of the other half of what I worked on here. In terms of future work, the next obvious step would be to formalize public announcement logic with common knowledge. So um, this language has an extra operator, as you can see, CB phi. This is read as everybody in some group B knows that phi, and everybody knows that everybody knows that phi, and so on to infinity. Um, this language is more expressive than the basic modal language, so the completeness proof is a little bit more involved. Um, there's not many logicians in the room, but for those of you who are interested, one can show that this logic is not compact, so we can't use a simple canonical model construction for it. So that would be the next obvious step for formalization. Another area I would really like to formalize is the completeness of S4 modal logic with respect to the class of all topological spaces. So Topological models are kind of interesting because they 
provide a framework that's naturally suited to the representation of evidence and its relationship to knowledge and belief. Uh, this connection dates back to Tarski in the 1940s, but to the best of my knowledge, it hasn't been formalized in any theorem prover. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but MathLib has a really great topology library and topological semantics is a modern area of research in modal logic. So there's a lot of interesting work going on in it. So I would love to formalize this next. Um, that's my talk for today. So thanks for listening. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Paula. Uh, are there any questions? Um, uh, questions? Uh, I have a question, Paula. Uh, you said that the logic is not compact. Is it somehow close to compact? Do you have any theorems about that? Like, uh, is the appropriate space uh, locally compact or paracompact or something like that? That's a good question. Um, so I haven't formalized this because I actually haven't looked into the theory that much myself. I can point you, I can point you to where in the book um, that I formalized that they talk about this and I, I, I could get back to you on that. Okay, we'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, question. Yeah. Uh, have you ever used classical uh, reasoning in your formalization? Yeah, there, there's lots of classical reasoning in my formalization. Okay, so if you go back to, um, can you go back to the um, semantics page, the definition of semantics? Okay, let's see. Uh, so these I... implications, right, so these implications in the meta language is classical, right? Co correct, so, yeah. Okay, that's why you can have all the other um, connectives um, defined. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure what you're asking, but uh, are you asking? No, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, without um, without classical inferences, you cannot. You probably cannot have the um, the connectives translated to each other in the um, target oh. logic. Okay. Sure. Yeah. 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 Oh, so this was classical stuff. I, as a mathematician, of course, I thoroughly approve. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you talked about undefinability. Do you, uh -huh. have an, do you have an explicit example? Yeah. So, for example, um, the class of finite frames is undefinable. And uh -huh, yeah. on the other hand, the class of infinite frames is also undefinable. Oh, I was suddenly worried that you were going to say, oh, they exist by the axiom of choice. and No, I know these are these are nice examples. I see. Yeah, there are more I could I could uh, I don't have any off the top of my head, but I uh -huh. I took a class in this a year ago and I learned about a lot of them. So <laughs> they're pretty interesting. Yeah, I, hey, I like the axiom of choice. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We can have a vote. Hello, Paula. Hello, Paula. May I ask a more broad question? So Many of the results that are showing seems to me that as a well-known results, right? So, what exactly are you expecting uh, expect to, to to learn or or achieve with the formalization? Um, for me, I mean, partially this was um, a project in learning how to formalize, right? So, I'm one of the newer members of the community, so this was an area of interest for me that um, that I could get excited about enough to formalize the whole theory of. Um, so you're right that like what I formalized so far doesn't really, um, add much to the body of knowledge, I guess, in dynamic epistemic logic, but there are people in my department, um, Adam Bjorndal, for example, who is working on, uh, who's working on this subject. And, um, it would be cool to, you know, prove some theorems myself that are new in this field and then be able to formalize them. So that, that would also kind of be a next step for me. We have nearly half a million lines of MathLib code, and every line in that is a well-known mathematics. Sure, it hasn't yeah. stopped us at all. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not saying that it's not in, uh, interesting and important. I'm just, I was wondering if you have an application in mind, for example, something that would take the these as a library that do that could do something. That that's why I'm, I, I ask it, right? So. Um, so, uh, I, no, no immediate um, applications come to mind. I know that um, someone in the CS department at CMU, I think maybe it's Andre Plotzer, is, is using dynamic epistemic logic, I think, to model like the Boeing Max um, that crashed 
a couple of years ago. So that's kind of an application of it. Um, this is used a lot in cryptography. So if those people want to contact me, they're welcome to use my formalization, but I don't have any immediate uh, applications for it. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? I yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm curious about the, like the formalization, like what was the, what was the challenge? What was, what went well? Like, I, I haven't tried to do anything like this in, uh, in my end using that, but so I'm curious how smooth it was. So I think the most challenging part was with the frame restrictions. Um, so I guess, I guess theoretically we're using this logic to make it simpler, like I said, but I think in lean, it was actually maybe a little more complicated because um, say proving that two sub uh, two two um, restricted frames were equivalent um, wasn't as easy as it as it is in set theory. Um, it was it amounted to showing that these two subtypes were equivalent, and I had to define isomorphisms between the subtypes. And so there was kind of a lot of work involved there. Um, I think that was that was maybe the most challenging part. Um, I mean, a lot of parts where I thought like the definability stuff. I thought that that um, was formalized nicely in lean and that you could kind of, you could say exactly what you wanted to say in math. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have to take a look at the code too. Thanks. It's, yeah, it, it's it, all up As there. ever, it's equality. <laughs> Things which mathematicians say, oh, these are obviously equal. And yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Hang on a minute. <laughs> you think about it, are they really equal? Yeah. <laughs> so, when I, I started doing lean by formalizing undergraduate problem sheets, first year undergraduate problem sheets, and one of the questions I'd put on my own problem sheet was this blue eyed islanders question that presumably you're aware of. Uh -huh. And uh, I remember the first time round, we had absolutely no idea how to even begin formalizing it. And I guess now you're giving us some general framework to formalize questions of this nature. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. yeah. Nice. Well, great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I have question. one more question. Oh, if, uh, go, go, if you go. Have time. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I have uh, I have found in other uh, other problems. Sometimes you you uh, in in lean and in provers you um, you define a uh, a logic or, or a logical uh, language, and it gets kind of uh, uh, difficult to to con uh, conduct proofs in those languages uh, if if you're proving anything uh, significant. I was wondering. Uh, did did you have uh, did you have trouble proving anything in 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 those languages, or were um, the proofs? Uh... I don't know. I don't. Is Jeremy here? I'm not sure if he remembers anything that I don't, because uh, I worked with Jeremy on this. But um... well, I'll, I'll remind you, yeah, that you had to do even basic propositional logic. You know, P and Q implies Q and P. <laughs> you had to sort sure. of hack through the basic rules. So, yeah, I mean, there were some, yeah. you know, just there were some complexity <laughs> issues just kind of working did, with, the, with the low level formalism. Did you find a, uh, an approach that uh, that worked for you to, to help with, uh, with those uh, those proofs or did you just uh, suffer through the, 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 the difficulties? I don't know that it was quite suffering. So at first I think it was suffering, but then I think this was over the summer when I worked on a lot of these and uh, I, I just started to find it fun like a video game. So. Excellent, that's a correct <laughs> answer. You see, these yeah. computer scientists, all wanna, they want to take the fun out of it by automating it. Yeah. <laughs> writing the proofs is the fun part, exactly. Yeah. You stand up for writing proofs. Have you considered um, uh, PRing any of like, is there anything uh, parts of your project that that you thought uh, could be PR to Mathlib? Um, I I'd, I'd certainly be open to that. Uh, I haven't. I actually just finished this maybe two weeks ago, <laughs> so uh, I haven't gotten there yet. But that's definitely something we could talk about. Very good timing, mm. and also very nice slides. I should. I should oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Did Peter? Oh, yes. okay. Um, uh, so to what extent did your project build on top of MathLib and also there are decision procedures in epistemic logic. Would it be possible to uh, implement them with the help of this project more easily rather than just writing a separate tactic? Um, yeah, so, uh, so it did build on MathLib um, in that like I used, you know, I imported some basic uh, 
uh, libraries about sets and um, I think I used Linareth quite a bit. Um, so so it, it built on some of those things. Um, so in, in terms of um, like building on other people's work, I, I know that Min Chao, for example, a couple of years ago proved completeness um, with uh, modal logic. Um, and that, that was kind of an idea at first for me to build on other people's work. But again, part of the um, reason for me doing this was just to learn how to do a big formalization project. So I really wanted personally to implement every bit of it myself, but um, it's certainly an, it would have been an option to build on that. Does that yeah, answer Paula, your question? You did, you did use uh, uh, Zoin's Lemma, which came from uh, Johannes Holzl. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in the proof of Lindenbaum's Lemma, yeah. Yeah, also more specifically, uh, decision procedures that, that exist for epistemic logics, are, are they part of your project? Uh, if, if I had a, a formula in epistemic logic and I want to know if it's true or false, uh, can, I mean, Lean can obviously be programmed to answer such questions, but uh, normally you would write a separate tactic. Uh, yeah. In your framework, perhaps, is it going to be easier to answer such questions? Um, so I don't have any decision procedures right now, but that would be another great area yeah. to continue this project. Yeah, that would be neat. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.